Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I'm sorry if I look a bit strange in my video, but I'm trying to read Braille at the same time, so my computer is kind of beside me. Uh, my name is Kim Kilpatrick. I'm the current Vice President of Braille Literacy Canada. It's my great pleasure to introduce this session called Expanding the Frontiers of Literacy, Developing Braille Codes for, for Indigenous Languages. So our two wonderful speakers today, and now we've come back to Canada from our trip around the world. Uh, we have Jen Golden, who's the Accessibility Compliance Support Manager with Crawford Technologies. And she has a master's degree in linguistics, and she has been, was president of Braille Literacy Canada, and also has served on or is serving on many international Braille organizations. And Christine Muse from Halifax joining us, and Jen is from Ottawa. Uh, she's a certified Braille transcriber with APSI for over 15 years. Um, and she was honored with the Lewis Award last year for helping in the development of the Mi'kmaq Braille Code. So welcome to you both, and uh, please take it away. Well, thank you, Kim. That was a lovely introduction. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jen Golden. And what we're going to do is um, I'm going to start off the presentation with sort of some more broad, uh, big picture information on developing Braille codes. And then what's going to happen is um, Christine will then take over and she will talk about the very specific instance that Kim was referring to for which uh, she won an award. And so I'm going to do my best not to steal any of Christine's thunder. So uh, my stuff is going to be very general, but of course our topics do overlap. So uh, with that, I'm just going to jump in and get underway. And then after, of course, when we're done, there'll be time for questions and we will answer depending on you know what the question is, whichever one of us is best suited. So um, the reason that this, there's a number of reasons that this has become um, much of a topic of conversation. And so I'm not going to spend too, too much time on that, of course, and because Christine will, will cover this a little bit too, because it's what prompted her interest. But one of the things that has, that has happened is that, and Kim sort of alluded to this, I, I'm involved in other, um, I'm the chair of BANA, and I represent Canada on the International Council on English Braille, ICEB. And ICEB in the last couple of years has received um, a few, I guess, queries on how, on, on developing Braille codes for other languages. And of course, ICEB being about English Braille, it's a little bit beyond our scope. Now I'm saying R and I mean ICEB. Um, it's a bit beyond I ICEB scope. And so there was sort of some discussion about, well, you know, what do we do about this? We don't want to ignore it. It's important. And, and what was happening is that we had found out of a couple of instances where people were just going, oh, you know what? I can whip something together. You know, I'll just plug some stuff into a computer and 15 minutes later, voila, we have a braille code. Well, I, I don't know if that makes you cringe as much as it makes me cringe, but you know, we felt like, okay, this is something that needs to be addressed. There needs to be information available so that when people are are searching online for Braille codes or what do I do if I think that there should be a Braille code, we wanted them to um, find something. And so that kind of started us on a bit of a journey. And um, I had this in my notes to sort of talk about at the end, but it now just makes sense for me to say it now. At the beginning, basically, ICEB had decided, you know, we're going to just put together a high level document on, okay, what, what do people need to consider? What are the things they need to know? What should the overall process look like? And so that's pretty much what my portion of this presentation is actually based on is kind of along the lines of those documents. I um, put the document together. It's not available yet. Uh, it will be, it will be soon. Um, and I did have discussions with uh, Dr. Robert Engelbretson, who many of you may know, he spoke at our symposium last year. He's a, a linguist in uh, the U.S. And uh, so I definitely want to give him credit because he and I, you know, he, um, I, we had definitely had some conversations with him and, and got his input too. So all of that to say, that's why this you know, part of why this issue, be, you know, is sort of top of mind. And it fits in with my ed educational background, which I don't get to use every day. So it's kind of exciting for me. <laughs> so, um, and uh, 
with that, I'll just jump in. So when it comes to developing a Braille code, whether it's for something specific in within a given language or for a different language altogether, really the big thing is it's not as easy as people think. It's not just a matter of sitting down and going, huh, I like this symbol. Maybe we'll use it for this. So the factors to consider when uh, developing a Braille code, and I'm, I'm saying specifically for Indigenous languages here because this is the context that, that we're talking about, especially uh, once I hand things over to Christine. Basically, probably first and foremost, it must be a collaborative effort. So the last thing you want to do is be like, you need a Braille code and I'm going to be the one to do it for you. That's really not how we want this to go. That, that really doesn't work well in any situation. And so um, it needs to involve um, a certain, you know, different categories of people. And what I mean by categories is, is not in any sort of way of putting people in boxes, but um, this really should go without saying, but I'm, I'm going to say it. it. It needs to involve people who know the language, right? You can know a lot about Braille, but if you don't know the language, you're going to have some problems when you're trying to develop the code. So needs to involve people who know the language. And yes, it does need to, to involve people who understand not only just someone who can read Braille, but somebody who understand, somebody who understands how Braille codes work, some of the principles that you need to think about when you're developing a Braille code, regardless of what the code is for. There's certain things that you need to think about. I'll just throw out one example here. Things like, okay, if you're going to choose a symbol for something, you know, you want to think about um, what are the most, what are some commonly used um, symbols that are very common. So let, as an example, when it comes to developing contractions, right, you, you think about one cell or two cell contractions for things that are really common you're not going to you know in english we there are some things where we just we don't have contractions for them because it's not a very common um letter grouping in english for example so i don't want to get too bogged down in this but um you know uev has a principle where we we have like root symbols um and again i know james um James may have touched on this a little bit and, and it might be coming up in our next presentation, but there are principles that are used to develop, to decide, you know, which symbols, you know, why is, why is dot five N name and not, I don't know, nocturnal? Well, you know, one of the many reasons would be that name is a much more common, uh, commonly used word. So you want to you want to have both of those understandings. A third piece of the puzzle is somebody who understands the print orthography of the language because Braille and you know Braille is to those of us who read Braille what print is to sighted people who read conventional print. And so Braille is kind of it's representing ideally the same things that the print orthography is representing. So you need to think about well what is the print orthography? How does it work? Um, and so you need somebody who who understands that. And I'm going to come back to this um, when I talk about a couple of examples. As I said, it's not quite as straightforward as as you might think. So you need these pieces. You also just you also need to know, is there an existing code already? Maybe there is one and you weren't aware of it, for example. And so, um, you know, one place to check is World the World Braille Usage, which is a book that um, it's massive and it's kind of hosted by Perkins. And um, it, it's got, there's a PDF version and a BRF version and it has, it needs to be updated, but it does have a lot of the Braille codes around the world. And it has sort of some basics about the code. It's not going to make you an expert, but at least you can look, it's a place to start. And um, Daphne, I can, we can make that resource available for people. It's quite fascinating actually to look through it. There's there's also a BRF. I can't remember if I mentioned that. Um, so you need to kind of have these groups of people involved. And as I said, because you want it to be a collaborative effort, right? You don't you want to make sure that it's people from the linguistic community who are going to benefit from this. Um, people who are actually Braille readers who really stand to benefit from this code. And your Braille code, in order to be an effective code, it's it's not just letters of the alphabet, although obviously that's important. It needs to have things like punctuation. 
accented characters, uh, numbers, and, and there may be other symbols specific to that language that, that you need to think about as well. Um, a discussion about, okay, should we, should we develop any contractions for this? And, and there's all sorts of things that could come into that conversation. Obviously, you want to start with things like the alphabet and punctuation and those sorts of things that you really need. But I just want to kind of, and in this, this short of a time, I don't have time to kind of go into the rationale behind everything, of course, but I want to just kind of put out there the different things that you need to consider. Mathematical symbols. Um, you want to think about formatting. How, what, what formatting principles are you going to follow? Um, I would recommend, you know, the country where the language is being used, whatever formatting rules that country follows. So, for example, in Canada and the United States, we follow BANA formatting guidelines. And so it would make sense for any Braille that's being produced in Canada to at least follow in terms of formatting to follow those guidelines. It makes it easier on the Braille reader who's going to be reading maybe things in English, maybe reading, you know, things in in the language that the code is being developed for. So again, formatting is something that, well, you don't want to reinvent the wheel. It's something that you need to think about. Another issue is consistency and symbol usage. And so what what this is about is if, if for anybody here who reads, let's say, French, Spanish, and Italian in Braille, you'll, you'll know that there's certain symbols that are used for accented characters. And while they aren't exactly the same, there's a lot of consistency so that, you know, when you see certain symbols, I, a couple of years ago, I started learning Greek and a lot of the accents were similar to those that are used in French, Spanish, and Italian, even though Greek is a very different language. It made it a lot easier for me to basically memorize, you know, to get become familiar with the accented characters. And so while you can't be expected to know what languages all of these, all of the potential readers of the code that you're developing, you can't be expected to know what languages they may or may not learn. The more consistency there is, the better. So it's just using well-established um, principles and patterns is a really important aspect when you're when you're thinking about you know I kind of say like you don't want to reinvent the wheel for for no reason um again the buy-in of the linguistic community and um the buy-in of of readers as well um and and there are lots of political and, and I use that term a little bit loosely, but there are some political things that you need to bear in mind as well. And I'm gonna just give you a couple quick examples. Um, in the um, in Inuktitut, the there are two alphabets um, in in terms of print orthography, and I think there actually may be more, but basically it's possible to use the Roman alphabet, and there's um, um basically a syllabary so, so based on syllables, and at one point there was an initiative to develop a braille code for Inuktitut, which is absolutely fantastic. However my understanding of this situation is that um, the syllable-based alf alphabet was used, but there were many people who just couldn't use it because they didn't, they weren't familiar with that print orthography. They used the Roman alphabet. Um, and I believe it's in Cree, uh, one of my, um, a professor in one of my last, uh, the last courses that I took, she was talking about putting together, she's been very involved in putting together online dictionaries uh, for various Indigenous languages, particularly Cree. And she was saying that one of the conversations that happened, and this was nothing to do with Braille, but she's saying there is not necessarily, it's not necessarily homogenous. So there are a couple of different orthographies and some communities prefer one, some prefer the other. And in her case, she was dealing with a dictionary. So there were also issues of, well, no, this is how we spell the word. And somebody else said, no, 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 no. This is how we spell the word. So things like that just shouldn't be left to assumption, right? So that's where you really need to have the conversation. And again, I'm going to leave that to Christine to talk about the specifics of her journey, but that's a really important part of the process is to make sure that you're you're not sort of going in and making some decision. And again, this is people's intentions are good, right? I'm not suggesting that people are trying to be uh, um, what's it, like patronizing or anything. It's just when you don't know the backstory and things, when you don't know sort of the, again, politics or the, you know, just some of the, the backstory on different things, 
you're not necessarily going to know what the best approach is going to be. So all of that to say, this is like the huge, huge, huge importance of um, collaboration. So I'm just going to finish up my time by talking about sort of the approval slash endorsement process and why this happens and how how we did it. Again, I'm going to do my best not to talk not to take away anything from Christine's presentation, but I was on the BANA board when, um, so there's a, a Navajo code that was recently developed in the U.S. And the person who developed it was not only, she was, she was um, uh, visually, she was blind or partially sighted. I She had a certain level of vision. She was a TVI and she was Navajo. So she was just in a really good position being a braille reader, being, you know, she, she had a lot of the pieces of those, of, of the puzzle that she was, she was able to bring to the table. And she worked with lots of people um, to get, um, to, to develop the code. And then Banna was asked to approve it. And now the immediate reaction of people tends to be, oh my goodness, this is so, um, who do you think you are to approve this code or, or whatever, like this kind of, this kind of response. Now, I want to make it really clear. That's not what this is at all. It's not about Banna or BLC saying, oh, you know, in order for you to use this code, we need to approve it. What's actually going on here is, first of all, we're approached by, you know, different linguistic communities to approve slash endorse the code because, um, and just to give a really tangible example, let's say that somebody wants to um, wants to apply for a government grant to produce Braille in this code for whatever reason, like, you know, producing signage, producing whatever it might be. Sometimes for certain grants, they want to make sure that you're using an officially accepted code. They want to make sure that it's not like, let's say I wake up one day and go, you know what, I'm going to develop a, a code for, you know, some language. And I just sit there and I make it up and here's my code. And the people who actually will use it say, you know what, that's, that doesn't actually meet our needs. But I somehow get a bunch of funding and I try to make my code, you know, I, I try to sort of take over with my code. What we want to make sure is that there is consistency, that that the code that's developed can be successfully implemented, that it actually meets the needs of the people who are going to use it. And so there is value in being able to say, you know what, this code that we worked on that is approved by the linguistic community is actually an official code and is therefore the one that that governments should be willing to fund. And so that's what it's about. It's, it's you know, it's not about BLC or Banna saying, yeah, it's okay with us if you use this code. What we're actually endorsing, which is why I sort of keep using approve, sometimes I say endorse, um, because it's a little bit uncomfortable to approve or endorse a code where you don't actually speak the language of the code. But what, what, what BLC said when, what was actually saying when, um, the Mi'kmaq code was endorsed. And what Banna was saying was, was not, yeah, we know the language and, you know, yes, we're, I, I don't know, whatever, like we're giving permission. That's not it at all. What we're actually saying is, yes, this code was developed in accordance with sound principles for developing a Braille code. And so we have every confidence that this code um, can be successfully implemented. It took into account all the things it needed to take into account. And so that's really just us saying, you know, endorsing kind of the process. We're endorsing the fact that that this code really has a great chance of being successful. Goodness, I'm good thing it's Friday. Successfully implemented. And we also were sort of acknowledging, yeah, and this was this was um, endorsed and approved by the linguistic community. So Christine, I'll talk about this more, but one of the things that we did when we approved it, and I'm so kind of saying we, it was, I, I was no longer on the BLC board, but for Banna, I was um, at the time. And we had the information from Christine all about the code. We also knew about the process she followed. And we had letters of approval from the respective, uh, the chiefs of the respective linguistic community saying, yes, we, we are good with this. We would like this to be an official code. So that's kind of, so that's sort of the overarching principles of uh, developing a code and just why we, why we had it go through Braille authorities, why we did the things that we did. So I think um, I'll leave it there. That's kind of, I want to I want Christine to uh, tell you her specific journey because that's really exciting as well. So with that, I will hand it over to Christine. Thank you very much, Jen. 
Um, as Jen said, uh, it, it was quite a journey. Uh, I think at the beginning for me, trying to find the information was the hardest part. And I think once this outline gets um, gets uploaded, um, it will definitely make it a lot easier um, next time. Um, at the beginning, I, I, I kept looking online. I couldn't find anything at all on, on any sort of languages other than what Carol and Justin had already started on. Um, I feel like I wasted quite a bit of time at the beginning just trying to, because there was nothing out there, I didn't know who to approach. Um, so I started off um, getting in touch with Carol and Justin, uh, who wrote a really amazing paper on Indigenous languages, um, which is footnoted in my, my code there. Um, after speaking with Carol, she got me in touch with uh, Dr. Engelbretson also. Um, and he he was a great help, obviously, being a linguist and a, a Braille user as well. Uh, from there on, I just basically tried to follow exactly what Carol did. She, she sent me a, a rough outline of her process. Um, it was really important to me that I speak with Bernie Francis, uh, Dr. Francis, who actually created... Uh, the Mi'kmaq print orthography. He was really hard to track down. He's a he's a busy man, but he did eventually meet with me, and uh, that was very informative. I I was trying very hard to understand the the structure of the language. I had no idea that the symbol I was trying to devise the correct uh, Braille symbol for was a schwa, for example. Um, so as Jen pointed out. Um, you know, meeting the right people, using Bernie, um, getting getting the approval from from both uh, the band here in Nova Scotia and in Maine, really important as well. Um, Justin Justin's paper had one. I really like the way he worded something here. Um, this article documents potential benefits and social impacts, thus demonstrating the value of creating Braille codes for Native American and First Nations languages. This is not the same as telling an Indigenous nation that they need to adopt a Braille code or that someone should make a Braille code as a gift to an Indigenous people, um, just basically to let them know that it is possible to create one. And I really like the way he worded that. Um, so the approvals went through, uh, and I, I'm really happy, as Jen said, it's, it's not so much that Braille Literacy Canada or ICEB is saying, yes, we, we say this is right. But as she said, we, uh, this code went through the, the proper processes. Um, those processes will hopefully soon be documented online. And um, it's all going to live in one place. So. Anyone who wants to know if there is a, a code available can go to one place and look, it's not, okay, where do we go from here? Um, and I think that's that's gonna be really helpful. And just sorry to interrupt you, Christine, I just, it, it occurred to me. Um, so Carol, um, Christine's referring to Carol, Carol Begay Green, she was the, the, the woman I was talking about who had developed the Navajo code in the US and Justin, uh, Salisbury is that, that Salisbury, yeah. yeah he actually is Canadian um I believe he now lives in the U.S. he's um a braille reader and he's he is I believe he is Micmac and he worked with Carol on this this paper that Christine is referring to uh, so I just wanted to clarify who, who yeah um, sorry about who that. they are oh, yeah that's, yeah so as, as far as my journey goes, um, that pretty much covers it. It, it just slides in right along with um, everything Jen just outlined there. Um, it was really exciting to get it done. Uh, we, we have used it here. Uh, Nova Scotia became or uh, adopted Mi'kmaq as its official first language shortly after that. Uh, so I'm really hoping to see it on some uh, accessible signage at the new Mi'kmaq Friendship Center. And our APSI library is also expanding our, um, our collection development. 
And we started with a lot of indigenous uh, titles, some a lot of uh, Robert Munch books that have been translated by Bernie Francis into Mi'kmaq. Um, so yeah, it's it, it, it's getting out there now. So that's really exciting as well. Oh, and I think too, um, Christine, I, I, you're, Christine's being very modest, I think, because she, this was a long process, right? Trying to track people down and, and trying to get all the information and, um, yes. just putting in that time, like that, that dedication. So, um, I don't want to embarrass you, but thank you. I mean, that's, it, it was great. And I, I love that, you know, this collaborative effort happened and it was so timely because when Christine wrote to me like when we were just getting the approval processes going and the code had been developed that's when I think that's when you told me you said oh and by the way they're building like a Mi'kmaq friendship center and they're going to put signs in braille in like English and Mi'kmaq and I'm like well how cool is that the code is developed like sort of just in time so absolute um, perfect timing yeah and and I did spend a year emailing a lot of people and pretty much being ignored as well. It's amazing how often you end up in someone's junk folder when you email out of the blue. But when you're persistent, it pays off. Yes, it does, for sure. I'm not sure um, if anyone has any questions or... Um, that's wonderful, you two. I, I I was fascinated about this from the first time that I heard about it, and it's fascinating to hear the background. Um, I had a quick question while we're waiting for hands, and that is, Christine, was it a, a certain student or something you were brailing, or was there something that you um, found, you know, like to get you started on the journey? Like, was there something that instigated that journey? Um, th th it wasn't a particular student. Uh, I do school curriculum here in, in Eastern Canada. Uh, so I, I mean, Mi'kmaq has appeared, <clears throat> pardon me, in a lot of textbooks over the years. And, and any time there was a large passage of it, um, using the, the modifiers, it was, it just, I can't imagine what an ugly read that would have been, um, for someone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and when, with all of the, it, I started my work around two years ago, there was a lot of talk about truth and reconciliation, um, you know, regaining languages. And I thought, wow, if someone was blind and wanted to regain a certain language, then that, that might be a problem. Um, yeah, so I, I was just motivated by that. Uh, I felt because I had come across it here, um, I felt that made it a need. Uh, I, I felt it was probably something that I could address and wanted to help if I could. So it was just, I spent a lot of time just trying to put it out there that I was, you know, I was willing to do this if, if I could, if, if there was a need and I could get it done. That, that is well, so wonderful. That is so wonderful. Sorry, Jen, you were going to. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, Christine, just it just prompted me. Um, one thing that I didn't mention is that there's this, this whole challenge when it comes to something like this, where you kind of go, okay, developing a Braille code, is there, is there a specific need? Like, do we have specific students? Or do we have, you know, and, you know, there's from one perspective, you have, you'll have, you know, maybe administrators or like, you know, people who are thinking about budgets and, you know, producing things kind of going, well, you know what, you, you have to demonstrate the need, you got to demonstrate the business case. But on the other hand, if you do have a student who needs this, right, you can't say to the student, well, you know what, can you just wait a couple of years while we develop the code, just put, your, put things on hold. So it's kind of like the chicken and the egg or the cart and the horse situation where, you know, it's, it's, do you develop the code even if there's not a need, like a specific need, or do you wait till there is a specific need, in which case that that initial student is kind of going to be, I don't want to say out of luck, that sounds, you know, but um, so I think this is this is great because if it gets on signage, it's it's that whole, you know, I think Diane talked about this, how, how sighted kids see print around them, and for Braille readers, that's less you know, it's, it's less prevalent. And so, you know, 
then it, it's it's getting out there. It's it's not necessarily, you know, I'm sure it will in some point in the near future benefit some students, but the fact that it's going to be on signage, it's going to start exposing people to the fact that it exists and, you know, it's out there. So oh, that's great. I, I wasn't implying that that it was only because of something, but I just wonder sometimes where is that spark going? Where does it come? Yeah, mind? no, it's a good it's a good question, yeah. Kim, for sure. Yeah. Um that's wonderful and I'm just so excited about this. But do we have any and I'm gonna turn this over to Anthony to see if we have any questions. I noticed we've been getting a lot of congratulation messages in the chat, which is nice. <laughs> um but are there any other hands, Anthony? Yes, we have uh Misty. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. A bit of background noise, so I apologize for the wind and everything. I'm outdoors at the moment. Uh, so uh, basically, I am essentially your average Jane Doe Braille reader, but I am also a Latinist by training. And I know I think I talked about this at the same symposium last year, kind of throwing some ideas out there. But now that we're discussing this as a specific subject area this time, um, I am curious about getting started, uh, possibly developing a contracted Latin Braille code. Um, I remember a, talking to you. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. No, I've, I've seen a few attempts out there, but I'm honestly, from what I saw of them, I was not too thoroughly impressed just with, in my amateur opinion, of course. Uh, but I mean, I, like, as, I, as far as I know, for instance, there's, for instance, there's no real authority for ancient languages out there. Like there, there is for like modern languages, no, like Vanna, for instance. No, there's really not. Yeah. Um, and like, how would you go about like, who would you get in your circle for developing an ancient language code like that? How would you, how would you propagate it? How would you try to bring it into acceptance in the wider classics and Latinist community? You know, just, just kind of throwing some questions out there about and what your thoughts are on that. I would say initially email me, um, maybe I'll get my contact information to you. Maybe Daphne, you could help connect us because, um, I'll just try to answer high level, but it would really be like, I'd be happy to work with you to, to come up with some strategies. And then, um, I've had one or two other people ask me about not necessarily for Latin, but, um, for other ancient languages. And so, it's certainly something I can raise in different places. And you're right, like it's not that Vanna would approve a Latin code, but um, we can certainly talk about ways to um, ways to promote it, who to talk to, how to involve like sort of people who can not only help develop it, but help promote it. So um, right. yeah, let's, let's chat about this. I would love, I also studied Latin, so. Oh, sweet, Optima, <laughs> I'm glad, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Alan? Uh, yes, I um, uh, I wanted to, uh, to uh, ask a quick question. I have a, a good friend from my school days who um, uh, came originally from uh, Baker Lake in the Northwest Territories. And um, the, the dialect he speaks or that he at least understands still to some extent, the dialect of an institute that he um, appears to still sort of know something about because unfortunately he's become really quite heavily assimilated. Uh, but he uh, he said it's a different one from say the one that uh, Mary Simon speaks. Right. Uh, she she apparently speaks a, a dialect from Baffin Island that's a little different from uh, the one from the one he grew up with. But he was telling me that he thought his language really wasn't very conducive to developing a braille code. And I'm just wondering if anything has been done using any of those dialects and sort of how far it's progressing. I would say two things in response to that, Alan. The first thing I would say is, I'm not sure I, you know, I referred to um, an attempt several years ago to develop a braille code for a Nuktitut, but I'm not sure which dialect it was. Um, I would have to see what I could find about that, but it, I want to respond to his comment about it not being conducive to a braille code. I, I think that's like saying that a language isn't conducive to having a print orthography and that I don't, I would never say that about a language and I wouldn't, um, so no, no criticism of your friend, but I just think, no, I, I, I wouldn't say that 
Well, the, the only reason I mentioned it, the only reason I mentioned it was that basically, you know, let's let's put it this way. He said it, I didn't. Oh no, so, for sure. I guess so I, I'm, it, I'm not... it's just a matter of trying to find out whether anything's been done so that I can, you know, if I get a chance, maybe you know, I might get a chance to tell him about something that's you know being worked on. Yeah, I, I don't know of anything off the top of my head. I know there was um there's a code for Inupiaq in Alaska, which I believe is a different dialect. I guess I would just tell him, I mean, I, I can, I'll see what I can find out, but I would, I would just let him know that because there are braille codes developed for all kinds of languages around the world, there's no logical reason why his dialect would not be conducive. And, and again, I, I'm not criticizing him either. I can understand why he, he might think that, but you know, well, you I, could I, let him I, know. I, I happen to agree with you <laughs> because I mean, obviously, <laughs> I you, you know might. what, you know what my field, uh, you know, was, yes. uh, was working and you know that obviously this kind of thing is of a certain amount of interest to me. So for sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Manik, oh, your hand just went down. I, um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, um, first of all, I have a question and a remark to, to make, if you don't mind. So, my question is, did you de develop uh, contractions for the, um, the, language, the code that you created? And I wanted to add something about contractions or no contractions. Uh, in Hebrew, uh, they didn't include contractions. And the reason why, and I think it's quite logical to me, is that at least in modern Hebrew, we, do, we only read, we only use consonants. So the vowels, yes. we have to add them ourselves. So that uh, adding um, contractions and this difficulty, I mean, if you know grammar well, it's all right, but it can be a little difficult. So it's interesting because it's at, at once an old language and a new language, and so they they were confronted to those kinds of problems. So I think I will leave it to Christine to explain, you know, to talk about what she did with contractions or didn't do with contractions. I would just say I, I'm also taking Hebrew, and I, there's a part of me that's like, oh my goodness, I'm glad there aren't contractions because, yes. <laughs> you know, like just learning because of, because of the way the language works. I think in Hebrew, as you said, like that makes perfect sense why there wouldn't be contractions. I, I think part of, you know, do we develop contractions maybe depends on the, some of the mechanics of the language, like that example that you raised is, is a really good one. So, um, I don't know, over to you, Christine. Uh, we did not um, develop any contractions for Mi'kmaq. Uh, I, I guess partly because it's not being heavily used by anyone at the moment. I mean, I, I wouldn't be opposed to to looking into that, but for for my for my initial purposes, um, contractions weren't on my radar. No. Well, and that's a really good point that you make too, because it's not to say that they wouldn't be developed in the future. Like exactly that that's, you know, a braille code can always be updated as a, and, and when it, it, that is needed. And that could, that updating could include developing some contractions. So exactly. Really and the, the framework is there now to, to add on to that. Okay. Next, uh, Jody. Hello. There we go. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, I'm calling from Australia. Jody. Hi there. Join yeah, the calling. meeting. I'm, I'm calling from Australia. Hello. You are our future. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's really early in the morning and I'm, I'm trying to be quiet because I've got headphones and I can't hear myself. But um, yeah, I'm a Braille transcriber from the New South Wales Department of Education. And we actually do have a specific need because um, as First Nation languages are being taught more in schools, our, um, our state's going to be rolling out a new Aboriginal languages curriculum. And so, you know, we're, we're needing to teach students and we don't have a Braille code for these languages. Um, you know, if there's blind or vision impaired students who are wanting to learn them. Um, we do have some challenges though, because some languages are not in a written form. In New South Wales, we have 35 active languages and across the country, we actually have over 300. <laughs> um, wow. So we're sort of 
thinking, I, I recently attended um, our Australian Braille Authority workshop on First Nation languages in Braille, and there were the questions about, you know, should we have a unified Braille code for all of our First Nation languages? Um, it's just a sort of early discussions and we, we were thinking it would be good to learn from other places around the world that have done this. So this new document that's coming out with the general principles will be really um, useful. But we're just sort of after advice, you know, when you don't have a consistent, um, maybe consistent spelling or orthography, you know, where where do we go? How do we start? Yeah, um, that's I'm very, a challenge. Sorry. Yeah, I'm interested to know more about the specifics um, of this Micmore language, like the decision, how you made the decisions on specifics, like you've already answered, talked about contractions, um, but when it comes down to accents, you know, just some of some, some examples, Christine, you know, and how you made the decisions. In all honesty, I between collaboration with Dr. Engelbretson and Dr. Francis, um, I kind of gave them the options and, you know, presented them with uh, what I was trying to do and, and because they were the experts, you know, which do you feel would best represent this? Um, so again, that, that's, I think, why it's so important to bring mm -hmm. in other people. I we had some Braille, interesting. I was speakers. a Braille transcriber, but I wasn't a linguist. I I knew nothing about the Mi'kmaq language, so yeah, between yeah. it was a three-way collaboration on that symbol. So, which symbol was that one? Sorry, uh, that was the it's a it, the main the symbol schwa, of Mi'kmaq that was missing was the schwa. It's a schwa. it's like a barred eye, uh, and there was no other print equivalent for it. Um, that I could find a braille in any in any other language. So that's that was the the hurdle we were we hit there. Yeah, and we Cody, I would sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to um before we run out of time, I wanted to suggest to one person that you may want to talk to is Christo de Clerc. Uh, from South oh, yeah, Africa because yeah. they yeah. have 11 official languages they have braille codes for all of them and they've managed to manage to sorry that sounds like oh they just they scraped by they they <laughs> were able to they found a way to basically harmonize yeah UEB, uh, um English Afrikaans and all the other nine um official languages Zulu and Saswati and and um all the other ones as well and so he would be a good person for you guys to talk to as well that's a good idea yeah because you know, in some of the different languages, they might use different print representations for the same sound, you know, and then, yeah, working with the communities, you've got political interests, like you were saying. Yeah, you know, to, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. That's good advice. Yeah. Uh, we've got time, I think, for one one more question, maybe two. We'll see. Uh, Ioana? Hi everyone. Um, I just was curious. With uh, it's an amazing achievement to build the code, and what a you know, like it, it's so many moving pieces of the puzzle. I was wondering if there is also an effort of developing then the, the teaching material, because there are all these codes, and of course there is the book of codes. I suppose that will incorporate them all, but it's not necessarily equivalent with how do I learn this code, because it exists, but how does it get into the hands of people who need it? So I don't know, like, is there a plan for didactic material for all these things? I'll let Jen cover that one because the I'm hoping all of the codes when they're developed will live at the same place. Um, at this point, I, I don't have a definite answer. I would say, um, yeah, there's, uh, world Braille usage uh, needs a good update. Um, and then in terms of like an actual instructional manual, I think it's going to depend on the code. Like, you know, we have, um, I know that Christine has made available sort of the information on on this code so that somebody can take it and go, okay, this is the symbol that's used for this. So you know which symbols to use. I think, um, I think in terms of developing instructional material, that's a, a different, you know, I know that's not a skill set that I have, right? I'm not, I'm, I'm a, I have transcriber, you know, all that kind of stuff, but I'm not necessarily an educator. So at this point, 
I guess my answer is I'm not really sure, but a place to start is, is looking at the actual code, looking at the symbols. And, and I think in the case of some of these codes where the alphabet, like there's, there's sort of less of a learning curve than, than you might think, because there are, you know, some additional symbols, maybe some punctuation, maybe some, you know, the schwa in this case, um, it would be more about just getting the information on the code and starting from there. Um, I would say it's a possibility that in the future, um, as more codes are developed, that there, there could be, there's the potential for somebody to kind of take that on. Um, right now, we're just trying to make sure that people know how to go about developing the code. So, you know, we, that, that's where we've gotten to this point. Thanks a lot. Okay, well, thanks very much, uh, Jan and Christine. Yeah, thank you. This thank was, you. This is very. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, and we're like we gonna a... end a great discussion, and great, great to have the turnout and the interest in this. And I'm sure we will talk more about these subjects. And uh, so that does it for me.